hello, 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 everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the third webcast in our series on purple teaming. And today we are focused on threat informed detection engineering. We have a ton of content for you. So we're going to go through this very, very quickly. Uh, hopefully you have caught the first two. If you didn't, it's okay. We'll get you up to speed very fast and then we'll get to detection engineering. So my name is George Orchias. As Carol mentioned, I'm a principal SANS instructor now. Got the promotion just a little above go. So very, very excited for that. Was uh, certified for four plus years and teaching for like 13. Uh, my focus is on the Purple Team curriculum. I'm the Purple Team ambassador and I teach Security 699 and 599. I'm also the Chief Technology Officer at Scythe, and I love contributing to the community with the Purple Team Exercise Framework, the C2 Matrix, our Attack Contributor, Atomic Red Team, etc. And with me today, I have an awesome detection engineer, Chris Peacock. How are you today, Chris? Hey, George, going well. Happy uh, Friday, Junior, and uh, thanks for everyone who's hopping on the webcast. Awesome. And Chris is a detection engineer over at Scythe, where I mentioned earlier, we built our own purple team uh, with folks doing red team, cyber threat intelligence, and detection engineer. Chris Peacock is our lead detection engineer there, and he's awesome. He has experience in Raytheon and General Dynamics, as well as a number of stations, and he's going to drop a ton of knowledge today. Um, as you are, will see in our agenda, we are going to cover lots and lots of detection engineer, engineering. <laughs> if uh, you have missed our previous SANS webcast on purple teaming, I am going to go very quickly on what is purple teaming. And then we're going to get into our detection engineering and go through the phases there. So what is purple teaming? It's a collaboration between various information skill sets. It doesn't matter if you are focused in cyber threat intel, or maybe you're focused on the offensive side, or if you're focused on the defensive side, you can purple team because it's a virtual functional team working together to test, measure, and improve your overall defensive security posture, your people, your process, and your technology. So we will cover a lot of these. Some organizations have dedicated cyber threat intelligence. Some of you vendors for that. And we're going to focus a little bit on the procedures of the TTPs. Up to us here, the red team is the offensive team that will uh, be the operators and actually emulating these attacks. And then the blue team, of course, is a catch all term. It includes all the defenders for maybe a SOC analyst, threat hunters, defer, detection engineers, or if you don't have this in your environment, you might have a managed security service provider. So as we had mentioned earlier, we cover the purple team exercise framework. We are on version two of it. Um, this is completely free and open to contributions. So go, grab it at our GitHub. I'll post the link here uh, as soon as I turn it over to Chris. But we covered this in the first two um, in the first two webcasts. We covered cyber threat intelligence, preparing for an exercise, running the exercise, and lessons learned. So again, grab that. It's free. It's a great way to start. Shows your management that you have a plan. You're following the industry framework for that. Let's go over to the next slide, Chris. So again, recap, if you were here for our first one, we covered how to get started, which is a team exercise. Bring everyone together and foster that collaboration. You have an exercise coordinator or project manager, introduce everyone, say, hey, today we're going to play these TTPs or maybe this threat actor if you're doing adversary emulation. You do a little tabletop to see what the expectations are from the blue team and maybe from some managers, uh, see if they match, document those. Then the red team goes, emulates that TTP while sharing the screen, showing all the spectators and everyone that is in attendance, 
how that works. The whole team follows their process. They show, hey, this TTP showed up on my dashboard, or I got this high alert, or I got this medium alert, or I didn't get any alert. Or maybe you got something forensically logged. Surely enough, you will find some gaps, and that is where detection engineering comes in, and that is our focus today. On our second webcast, we covered optionalized purple teaming, that you don't actually have to wait for an exercise. If we go to the next slide, you'll see a little process that we showed there. New cyber threat intelligence comes in or new TTP discovered. We analyze and organize. We do a little tabletop discussion. Red team emulates the attack. And then you do detection engineering to build out those data sources, make sure that you have visibility, make sure that you're collecting the right things, make sure that you are um, getting alerts and all that fun stuff. So that is our focus uh, today. And I think the next slide, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, who again is our lead detection engineer, has been doing this for many, many years, and he's going to drop a ton of knowledge. I do want to mention, though, before I send it over, that since he will be doing lots of the talking, um, feel questions at any time. I'll be monitoring the chat and the uh, and name. So if I can answer it, I will. Of course, my specialty is not detection engineering. You know, that's why we have our little purple team on this webcast. But try and um, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully have a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. So Chris, what is this detection engineering I care about? Thanks, George. You know, uh, it's something that we're going to dive into uh, a little bit later on in the slides, like you said before. But first, we're going to recap in case you weren't here for the first two episodes that George went over. Because if we look at the process, the, one of the first steps is, is that direction that we get. So that, that cyber threat intelligence and understanding those threats against us. So with that, we have to understand components of a threat. We have to see who has intent to target us. It could be a specific targeting, or it could just be someone who wants to make money. That's their intent. And then they have capability. As capability grows, the threat grows as well. So we've seen certain ransomware groups where they're able to acquire uh, zero days so that their capabilities are growing, which means that they're a greater threat. And then finally, opportunity. This is one area that we can control uh, with patching or having certain controls in place, implementing different uh, group policies, things like that. Opportunity, we can limit. But we have to understand that there is uh, components of a threat and we shouldn't go outside of that scope. So if we're looking at North Korea attacking South Korea and we're just doing something in the United States or something in Yes, you know, a European country, maybe that that's not a threat to us. So we shouldn't focus on that. And that's one of the things about threat intelligence that we have to focus on and be threat informed for our organization. And what this looks like on a basic level is we identify the adversary that we're concerned about for our organization. And then we go out, we gather that threat intelligence. Oftentimes it's reading different blogs and things like this. Uh, and then compiling that together by extracting the TTPs and developing a plan. One of the things we want to touch on briefly, and I think George might have used the Pyramid of Pain from David Bianco and both of his talks, I think, uh, before, but what we have to look at is at the top of it, where we get to those TTPs. We're not focusing on hashes, IP addresses, domain names. Those, those change so often. They're very easy for adversaries to change. So we have to get to the top of this and focus on the TTPs. But one of the things is, is everything right now is talking about the technique level. And what I like to liken this is, is how do you fold the cheese? So if the technique says fold the cheese, well, what do I do? Do I, do I separate it into quarters and then fold it, you know, right, left, right? How do I fold the cheese? What's the, the actual process underneath the technique? And when we look at that here with the TTP pyramid uh, that we released at Scythe, and we have a whole blog on that. If you want to go ahead and check that out, I think George might post the link if he gets a chance. But we see the tactic level is credential access here. And then we see the technique level. And this is where most cyber threat intelligence is at right now, where they say that they did credential dumping uh, for LSAS memory. And that's great. I can go grab a few atomic tests for that. But what happens if the adversary is doing a new procedure for that technique? Will our alarm still fire? 
or do we have to create a new alarm for that? These are things we have to look at, and this is where the procedure level comes in. Of here, we see that they use proc dump dash ma lsas.exe lsas underscore dump. So this is what we have to get down to is that procedure level so that we can better our detection engineering to make sure that it's addressing what our adversaries are doing. One of the areas that this looks like uh, from a quick overview is we have a report from Microsoft here. And we see that mshta.exe is making an, an outbound call to a 1443 address. So that's something that we can do and replicate in our environment. And then we can work on doing detection engineering around that. We also see who am I execution uh, that's outputting to a .txt file. So we're actually getting down to those procedures that the adversary is running. And this allows us to test it in our environment see if it fires alarms and if not we can do detection engineering around it and that's one of the areas where it means to be threat informed and we want to talk about that there's a human element behind this of why we get down to the procedure level because adversaries they have habits they have training they have certain tools that they use uh, consistently and they also have guides uh, the Conti guide was a huge one. We saw the same steps going over and over again in different DFA reports uh, with the Conti related actions that they were performing in environments. The other thing too is they were actually copying and pasting so much that one time they copied and pasted and it said like insert IP here and they didn't insert the IP and they actually pasted that into the command line. So there's a bunch of things that we have to look at when we're thinking about procedures adversaries can change them yes but they do have certain habits training and tools there's humans behind this malware there's humans doing this uh these actions on objectives so with that that's a brief uh understanding of the direction from that cti aspect of what it means to be threat informed but what that looks like here with the purple team workflow is we go through and we have that new CTI, which is step one, then we analyze and organize, which is step two, and develop a plan. We'll tabletop that before we do our emulation. And finally, we get that emulation and that kicks off our detection engineering. And that's how it fits into the purple team workflow. And what that looks like is something like this, where we have procedures that we extracted. In this case, it was ransomware uh, adversaries they're running things like IP config slash all system info, uh, who am I slash groups, different things like this. So we went through and we actually, we had our red team uh, emulate this attack, run these procedures. And then from there, we're able to see what was alerted in our environment or not. Uh, in this case, we see that who am I slash groups was alerted. We also see that net view slash all domain was alerted, but we see that we have some detection gaps uh, one of them being the NL test with domain trust. This is an interesting aspect because someone's enumerating all the trust in our domain. This is not a common thing that's occurring typically in domains, but the adversary is doing it. So we see that we can have detection opportunities because the adversary might swap out some procedures, but we want to have coverage of the majority of their procedures in case they swap some out. So with that, we have a, de a detection focus that we want to highlight is on um, the back end of the kill chain, because reconnaissance, if they scan us, uh, they're probably going to change their IP before they attack. Weaponization, we can't really catch because that's them building their payloads and things like this. So we're not going to be on their systems looking at that. We don't have access to it. And then delivering exploitation. These are areas that most of our vendors address. You know, we're going to have our firewalls. We're going to have our email gateways, things like that. But when we get to installation uh, and command and control, that's an area that we definitely can look at for detection engineering, uh, because, you know, once what happens once that that Excel macro uh, gets past our email gateway and a user enables it, well, then we can look at things like PowerShell coming off of Excel.exe things like this. And then we also get into actions on objectives. And this is where we really see tuning our EDRs or our Sysmon, tuning the environment uh, and those rule sets for our specific environment to catch suspicious activity. This is where we really get a lot of 
a lot of valuable detection engineering is at these phases and we want to catch it before impact. With that, we have some strategic drivers that we like to talk about. So we have the operational capability and that's how skilled we are and how efficient our tools are. We also have data collection. If we're not collecting the right data, then we're not gonna be able to do a bunch of detection engineering for an environment. And then finally, we see that purple bit in the upper back corner and that's where we get that threat understanding so that we're actually addressing uh, you know, our threats with our detections. With data collection, we're starting to think about what data are we collecting? And then where is it collected? Sometimes we might say that, oh, we need to write rules in the SIM. But then we go and we look at the data and it's actually in the EDR. Or maybe we're only sending alerts from the firewall and we need more data from the firewall. So we have to look at where it's being collected so where we can write those rules at. And then we also need to look at how do we prioritize data sources because you know there's certain sim licenses that it can be pretty expensive depending upon how much data we're ingesting so we have to look at how do we prioritize data sources and with that uh, we do have the attack technique count per data source and we can see that command execution and process creation are some of the heavy hitters here in this graph so having that host based visibility um, with an EDR system on, or even layer them together, that, that really helps us with our data collection to address attack techniques and sub techniques. But we can go through here and we can actually look at how to prioritize different things for our environment. And it's definitely a good resource to have. One of the other areas, though, that we said before is the operational capacity. And I liken this to the detection sideboard because this is how proficient and capable is the analyst and the tools. You can have great analysts that get inefficient tools and then it, they just can't work in an efficient manner. So it can take them months to actually take the data, figure things out and write detections for it. You can also have great tools that are underanalyzed or underutilized by novice analysts. So, this is a strategic driver that we have to think about from a high level view. And also time's a factor. If, if our detection engineers are also tier two or tier three SOC workers, if they're always working alerts, then they're not gonna have the time to actually uh, go out and look at the environment and figure out how to tailor rules to our environment. And then finally, we have that threat understanding. This is where that purple team comes in we want to understand our threat landscape. For example, uh, a few years ago, and still even to this day, uh, some organizations don't know that PowerShell is used maliciously. And so if you don't know that PowerShell is used in malicious activity, you won't try to detect it. So this is where you have to have that threat understanding. And we want to say again, you know, focus on the procedures, not the technique level. And we're also not looking at atomic IOC, such as IPs or hashes, they change too much. Uh, we want to focus on those procedures, such as how is the adversary using PowerShell? Are they using unmanaged PowerShell? There's different things like this that we have to get into to actually have detections around what our adversaries are doing. So we have that direction side, right? And then we want to get into the collection. With that, we need to verify that the data is collected around the events. Uh, sometimes people say, well, I don't know where this will necessarily be. Thankfully, if you're doing emulation, you're going to have like a process ID uh, and a host name that you can go look into, into the SIM, into an EDR, things like this. And then you start getting a sense of where the logs are. Uh, one area that we can do this in is detect, and we'll address that briefly in a few. Uh, but it's definitely a good thing to have. And then we also want to document visibility gaps if we identify them. Maybe we're only monitoring certain reg key edits and not all the reg key edits. So when we emulate this one attack, maybe we don't see that. We have to document this so that we can uh, start understanding where we have visibility gaps for our emulations. And then as we do our collection, we can start looking at what it looks like in our uh, defensive stack. And then we can understand potentially what we might search for to see this activity. Like we said, MITRE can help map this down to a certain level. So here we see PowerShell with a technique um, 
ID of 1059.001. And then if we go to the bottom of the attack page for this technique, we see that there's a few data sources and data components. So here we see process and process creation. Now that's not a log though. And what we have to understand is that attack stops here with that process and process creation. So in our environment, it might be registered as 4688, and then we send that to the SIM. So we have to start understanding where we dive down in each technique of what it maps to in our environment. And the one way we do that that I recommend is detect. This allows us to go in and we can say process creation, and then we can map it to our products. So here we have carbon black and Sysmon. And we're able to go through all the different data sources that are in attack, and then we're able to map them to our products so we know where that data is. And finally, once we fill that out in the text, which if you haven't checked it out by now, I highly recommend checking it out. It's a great setup to visualize the coverage of your log sources. Here we see that we're hovering over account discovery, and we have the available data sources, and we also see that our product for this is Sysmon. So it allows a nice visual and it also allows us to drill down on our products where it is when a red team gives us the technique ID, we can go in, see what products it would be in and then go down and try to catch that actual procedure that they did. And then after we do that collection side, we wanna get into processing. And this is really the meat and potatoes so to speak, of detection engineering, we wanted to hypothesize detection opportunities. It might be something where we have one source or a correlation between a uh, few sources. And one of the areas that we test the hypothesis is we cast a wide net and then we start narrowing it down so that we limit false positives. We wanna embrace a certain amount of false positives because we're trying to find suspicious uh, activity on the network. You know, if you haven't uh, checked out the Lawbass project, I definitely recommend checking out the Lawbass project. And that's why we get into suspicious activity because adversaries are using uh, built in functionality in Windows, built in processes, things like this. So we're looking for suspicious activity. It's not always going to be malicious. We need to embrace a certain amount of false positives. And we went over this slide before, but you know, developing a hypothesis just off the bat here, we can see that a law bass of MSHTA is making a WAN connection. This is where understanding different aspects of Windows and also the law bass project and how things are used maliciously, we can develop hypotheses pretty quickly. So for me, I would go look for MSHTA with WAN connections in my environment. That's a quick thing that I can hypothesize and test. We also see who am I execution. Now we'll get into some questions that we ask around different things to help scope it down for our environment. One of the things that we look here is that we do have a certain command line parameters being used. So that's something that we can hypothesize as well. And some of the questions that we go through here, we look at uh, what are the parts of the procedure and how are they used maliciously? We want to understand what the adversary is doing and how does that differentiate it from common normal activity in our environment. A, a vendor doesn't know what our environment is necessarily like, so we have to think about our environment and tailoring things such as Sigma rules or an EDR rule set to our environment. With that, we can look here and we see that we have CMD launching Who Am I? And we say that the adversary uses a CMD to enumerate the user via who am I and outputs the command line uh, response to a text file using the greater than redirect command. So we're starting to understand what the adversary is doing here. And that's one of the first things we want to do with the procedures. We, under we want to understand what's happening, what's occurring, and why is it malicious? The next question we want to look into is how often do the components appear in normal operations? So with this, we can say, how often does CMD launch who am I? 
if that's a rarity in our environment, we might be onto something. We also can say, how often is who am I used in our environment? Some environments, who am I is used a lot, and it can be tough to baseline. In other environments, it's very rare. Maybe in a smaller or medium-sized business, they've outsourced uh, you know, help desk activity and things like that. And those type of people, the, the managed service provider might not really come in too often and run who am I. So it may be a very rare event. These are things that we have to ask ourselves and baseline it for our environment. And then we say, is it common for who am I to be redirected to a text file? That's another interesting thing. So we have to start looking at different areas of what it looks like in our environment and how we could baseline it. We also want to understand uh, what common parent uh, processes we can tune into or out of. So with that, what process started this whole chain? You know, maybe in my environment, this does occur. Maybe it's some process associated with like a SQL server. Well, we can whitelist that process or we can, we can go ahead and tune that out. And then we can flag on anything else that's which start a similar chain of CMD with who am I? And then we also look at how often does CMD launch who am I? So once again, baseline that from our environment. We just need to look at different sub processes as well, um, along with the parent processes. And we can start understanding our environment better and how to detect suspicious activity. So with child processes, we can tune out or we can tune into those. So at times we might see here where we have excel.exe with run dll32.exe. This definitely looks suspicious. And this is one of the times that we can tune into it. Uh, one of the areas that we like to focus on too is, you know, our web servers commonly have zero days um, that get exploited. With that, what we can look at is suspicious processes to tune into, such as, um, you know, run DLL32 or a bunch of living off the land uh, binaries spawning off of our, our web server processes. So those are things that we can tune into at times as well. The other area that we look into is common command line parameters. And with this, we can tune into or out of certain uh, command line parameters. In this example, we have the greater than symbol uh, with the redirector in our environment. You know, maybe we have some system administrators who might run who am I, but how often are they actually piping that out to a .txt file? So this is an instance where we can actually focus on those command line parameters uh, and we can tune into that. And like we said before, you know, are there users we can tune into or out of? Like we said, maybe help desk you know, they run this, but maybe if the anyone in the accounting department is running, who am I? We could flag on that. So we have a bunch of different questions and a bunch of different areas, a bunch of different ways that we can start processing these to develop a detection for our environment to detect suspicious activity. And then we can also develop a few like we've gone over here uh, and we can layer those together as a defense in depth approach for our alerting. One of the other areas we like to look at is to see if there is um, if there's network connections around the process. So for here, we have PowerShell making an outbound call. One of the things we want to do when we're evaluating processes with network connections is we want to look at does it normally connect to local host? If it doesn't, is it used maliciously um, to connect to local host? We could scope in to flag on when it connects to local host then. Maybe the process only talks back to local host. And then if it goes anywhere else, then we could flag on that. So we want to start thinking about where it's calling out to, what it's communicating to, and then what's abnormal for it. And what we can look into when we do this type of processing is we want to 
cast a wide net. Now with this, it looks something like this when it's visualized. We might get a lot of benign events, but we're also probably catching a bunch of malicious events at the same time. Now, if I were to make this rule uh, that's being visualized right here, I would have a very uh, unhappy sock with me because they would be responding to false positives and then they would probably end up turning the rule off and then we would miss all these malicious events. So we need to do a little bit better job here. We need to tune down. One of the areas though that we get into is if we actually become too precise. If we become too precise and we tune the rule and scope it down too much, then we're actually missing a bunch of malicious events. Now, this is great from, you know, the not having benign alerts, a bunch of false positives. It's great that we've tuned those out, but now we're actually missing a bunch of the malicious events. So one thing to always think about is don't become too precise. And sometimes when you're doing the engineering, you need to actually step back um, from being too precise and seeing if you can actually scope out more to get a better high fidelity uh, rule set. Then the other area that we wanna look into is embracing a certain level of false positives. We've talked about this before, but this is what it kind of looks like visualized. So now we're getting more of the malicious act activity. We're going to have a uh, better recall. Recall is where we actually, what, we're, what malicious events, how much of the malicious events are we actually getting from this detection logic? So we want to get that better recall and we want to embrace that we will have some false positives. What we see here, we scoped it down. We have a few benign events and we're getting most of the malicious activity. And that's what we're trying to get down to. So what does this look like? Well, for our small test environment, we wanted to go ahead and look at what WMIC execution looked like in our environment. So we ran a 30-day search for WMIC activity. From there, we wanted to start asking our questions. And at first, there were some, you know, common ways that we went through that we couldn't really find a good tuning uh, around. But then we went to parent process. And it was here that when we saw the parent process, this one related to Amazon, uh, we investigated it and it was common activity for our environment. And you can see it highlighted here. There's a high count for it. We would go ahead and we could tune this out. And then we see from our actual threat emulation that we do have uh, emulated suspicious activity for WMIC execution. We can actually see the Scythe client uh, 64.exe. We see PowerShell, which is also related to our emulation as well. And so now we know that if we look for WMIC without a parent process related to the SSM agent worker, that we're going to be flagging on suspicious activity. And that's great because now we're going to have uh, low false positives, but we might have some. And we're catching that suspicious activity that's actually been proven um, to catch our emulated threat actors. So this is a great way of just going in and trying to get that other data in. If we go in and we just try to scope down um, to what we think will catch something, then we don't know if it actually will work. But when we have that emulated data from the purple team side, we can actually confirm that the rule is working and then we can actually rerun it to fire the alert and ensure that the response is appropriate to the alert as well. So once we get done with all of that, the last thing that we have to do is we have to do dissemination. And with dissemination, we need to deliver to the stakeholders. Um, you know, this might be delivering to the SOC as, a, as an alert. We might also have to document reasoning of why we developed this. We could also go down and give more context to the SOC. Uh, you know, why do we build this alert? What to look for? If this alert is triggered, I mean, what does it mean? 
and then also kind of guide them for potential responses. And this might be something where when we disseminate, we also work with incident response uh, to help develop, you know, an actual response to it if this alert should be uh, tripped in the environment. And then we also have to give things back to management. Uh, you know, they like to have reporting for tracking. We might also have to kick this back to the CTI team. They may want to record the content we generated. Maybe they can map it to a few attack IDs and then they can visualize the actual custom alarms that we have around attack IDs. So these are a few things that we have to look at. And then we also get down to, um, you know, giving it back if we have a red team to bypass the, the alert. This is one of those great areas where we can actually validate how, how the alert is working and, and the resilience of the alert. Because maybe the red team tries changing a little bit of the procedure, but the alert still fires, which is great. Maybe they change the procedure too much that the alert doesn't fire. So we may have to alter the alert that we made, or we may have to create a new alert. So we have that defense in depth approach. So these are some of the areas that we have to distribute back to. And definitely if we have that red team who can adjust to it, it trips the cycle again. And it really helps us do that cat and mouse game so that we're hardening our defenses and our alarms to catch malicious activity. One of the areas that we like to focus on too is um, leveraging Palantir's AES framework. If you're unfamiliar with this, I definitely recommend checking it out. Palantir, by the way, is a big defense company with lots of money to spend on um, detection engineering and security. So I will say this, that you don't have to do it exactly the way they do it. You know, maybe you're a smaller shop. That's fine. But this is a great starting point. If you're a big company, go ahead and, you know, you can, you can do this to the T because you have a big team. But if not, figure out what works for your environment from this framework, take out a few pieces, you know, put them together that works for your environment. And with that, you're able to have a process that you can document and you can help with those deliverables during that dissemination process. Um, so once we have that, we're kicking off the whole cycle again. And this is where we have the new CTI come in or the red team uh, changes the procedures and then we kick off the whole process again. And, but with this, what we're doing is I like to um, kind of say it's like a, a bank vault with lasers everywhere. The more lasers that we can get in our environment, the better chance we have of detecting someone when they're in there. So we wanna think about that as how we can tune it down to our environment how we can get to that next level and how we can keep cat and mousing ourselves, especially with that threat informed uh, CTI that we can get to kick this off. If, if we actually used uh, CTI appropriately, we could defend against ransomware actors a lot better because they keep using the same procedures over and over again. So it's just something as simple as going out, understanding the procedures that those adversaries are using, testing them in our environment, and then developing those engineering capabilities around the detection engineering capabilities around it. And then as they adapt um, those procedures, we keep going through this process and we keep developing new rules and we just grow and grow. One time someone asked me though, they said, you know, is detection engineering, do you have to sunset rules at times? Uh, or is it like IP addresses and hashes? Can we cycle them out? And a lot of times the answer is no, we can't cycle detection engineering rule sets out because if we sunset that, then the adversary could just drop back to that. And it could be the low hanging fruit that attacks that uh, procedure. So we need to keep that in place and we just keep building our defenses um, and our detections capability around that. So with that, get out there. I hope you'll have some uh, great detection engineering, some great threat hunting from this. Uh, obviously, sometimes 
you try to go in and you try to do a detection engineering for a certain rule set. And maybe it turns out that it's just a weekly threat hunt because you're looking for rare activity and you can't baseline it into an alert yet. So some of this stuff you can use for threat hunting as well, but I hope y'all go out and find some suspicious activity, hopefully not malicious, but we can start baselining those environments. And uh, with that, I believe I'll kick it back over to George. Awesome. Good. Uh, definitely good content. I want to, reiterate on uh, something you said of giving it back right after you know it comes from ctr maybe it came from the blue team or the red team you did all this work emulation detection engineering and then it's a cycle right so you give it back to the red team and the cti team to say hey, this is where we are of course you're going to want to have your control validation there uh, working as well so that all your hard work doesn't drift away uh, with environmental drift, right? And, uh, you know, so many times back in the day before we had this purple collaboration, you would hear the blue team saying, there's no way I'm giving that to the red team because we're going to catch them next time they come. There's no way I'm going to share my new cool detections because we're going to get them. And that's not the point, right? The point is to catch the real malicious actors and uh, working together makes us so much more efficient, not only for building the original detections, uh, but also ensuring that they continue to work and keep, you know, moving it forward and making it better. So awesome, awesome presentation. Can't believe you hit 40 slides in what, 30 minutes. We were, we were worried we were going to go over. Uh, but of course, we, we try our hardest not to because uh, we're respectful of everyone's time. So we covered quite a bit. We will be uh, releasing a blog post uh, here in the next week or two. So uh, the million dollar question we always get, will the slides be posted? The answer is yes, of course, you're going to get these slides and the recording immediately as well, immediately as in today, Carol's already cringing at me. Don't say immediately at some point today on your SANS web portal, and we have a ton of more resources. So let me go through a couple of those. First, SANS Purple Team. SANS.org slash purple dash team. This is where you find this webcast. This is where you're going to find the blog post that we're going to post that goes with this. This is where you will also find other workshops, other things we have, as well as our SANS courses. The SANS blog. There's a focus area for purple teaming. So as I mentioned, this is the third webcast um on this series and actually it's going to be the fourth blog post um because we did want to cover some basics first right uh, and we were able to do that all in one webcast so check those out as well and then i'm going to give you a shout out chris because you are running a detection engineer workshop um i think it's a week from now right may 20th so if you're watching the recording and it's past that time you can actually check those out. We do that through Scythe. And I know we mentioned Scythe quite a bit, right? Everything we gave there is free, right? Where there's not a sales pitch or anything like that. By all means, this is us between SANS uh, and Scythe uh, contributing back to the community. So the Detection Engineering Workshop is a free workshop where you get to actually uh, do hands-on keyboard stuff covered uh, by our very own Chris Peacock. So that's another one, right? Obviously this was all slides there. It's more hands-on. So check those out. And then of course, want to talk a little bit about our SANS Purple Team courses. We have two of those. Security 59, Defeating Advanced Adversaries, Purple Team Tactics and Defenses, and Security 699, which is a more advanced course on Purple Team Tactics, Adversary Emulation for Breach Prevention and Detection. If you go to the next slide, I actually did a little bit of um, a comparison here because lots of people say, hey, where, wh where should I go next, right? And if you're just getting started, right, Security 504, um, that's the uh, Hacker Tools, Techniques, and Incident Handling, uh, probably the first SANS course I took, um, actually teaching that next week. Uh, really love it. It's really the OG of purple teaming because that course covers how to do attacks, how to detect them, how to prevent them, as well as the instant handling process and instant response. So awesome, awesome course to get started. 
Do you notice the SANS courses have numbers to them? If uh, you've gone to college and seen those there, uh, the numbers do mean things, right? So the higher you go up on the numbers, the harder the class is. So if purple teaming is your jam, then uh, I recommend Security 599. That is Defeating Advanced Adversaries. You can see this on the left here. Um, it's a purple team class, has focus on red teaming, but more focus on blue. So you do emulations, and then you focus a lot on prevention, right? Always a goal. And then starts going into detection and response, which of course is a must. So this will cover things like Active Directory group policy and laps, and obviously doing the attacks, defending the attacks, preventing. And the course is 50% lecture, 50% hands-on. Now, if you're in this webcast talking about detection engineering, I would actually recommend, I mean, if, uh, if you're up for it, Security 699. It's one of the more advanced SANS courses, it's a 600 level. And this one focused 50% on emulation and red teaming and 50% on blue team. Now, it is advanced. So we cover some of the most common prevention you're going to see, things like application control, right? Or application allow listing, where you have things like app locker with allow rules, or you might have attack surface reduction. You might have some of these other uh, solutions like endpoint detection response. So we cover how all those work. Then we cover how to bypass them, right? Because you're not gonna be able to prevent everything. So we cover the red part of bypassing a lot of those controls. And then now that you understand the technology and understand the control, understand how to get around it, then you do detection engineering, right? Because at this point, we're not preventing anything. We are solely on the detection part and detection engineering is a huge part of that. So. We build detections, we go a nice stack, we use elastic, but most importantly, we use Sigma, right? Sigma rules are rules that you can uh, convert over to almost every uh, security stack, right? Microsoft, right? Almost everyone, but it allows you to go through this process of detection engineer through every module. And it's very, very hands-on. So it's 40% lecture. 60% hands-on, uh, very, very technical course. Real cool, the lab's on 699. You spin up, it, it spins up uh, this AWS environment. Uh, each student their own environment, so if you mess something up, it's okay. And you can keep those labs forever. Um, so you essentially have this nice environment uh, with you know an attack stack, things like Covenant and Caldera, with your defensive stack, things like the Hive and um, Elastic and uh, whatnot. So it's a really cool course. As you see, I'm very excited about it. I teach it quite a bit, but it is an advanced level course. Uh, that 699 should, should let you know of that. But we would love to have you uh, in any of these courses. Um, and I think this is actually the last slide. We could probably take uh, a few minutes of Q&A if there's any questions. Um, the question here from Wolf Wolf, probably not the real name, um, which of these courses are free and which are paid? So the workshops are free, both the Scythe workshops and the SANS workshops we give are free. Of course, these webcasts are free, the blogs, etc. The SANS courses, Security 504, 599, and 699 are not free. They do have a cost to them. Um, so if you are interested in that, you can, of course, purchase them as one-offs. You can also do corporate accounts. That's something I did when I ran the team at City, but was, uh, you know, buy a large portion of these and be able to send lots of people to these trainings and certifications uh, and everything like that. Um, another question we have here, can we expect a cert for $6.99 anytime soon? That's a great question. I know a lot of you uh, are kind of forced to get a cert after you take a class. And, you know, I, I, I don't feel uh, of that. I, I love doing it for the knowledge more than the cert, but I know the cert is important. The certification body is GIAC, G-I-A-C. 
and they're actually decoupled from SANS. So I believe they're working on one. Do not quote me. Um, I'm already getting looks. So um, I believe it's in the works. Don't have a timeline or anything like that. But yeah, definitely the, the more folks that take 699, obviously the more uh, push we can have for uh, having that course, uh, having that cert out. Any other questions? I have a question for Chris. Um, in the Conti playbook, we saw that some of the commands were mistyped. What is your feel around building detections for mistypes in, or mistypes, misspellings, I guess, typos in some of these commands, particularly when it's in a particular run book? I think you mentioned a little bit of copy and pasting. What should, should people be doing detection engineering for that as well? I mean, um you're going to run into resilient factors, right? Because depending upon how you scope it, uh, it's not going to be too resilient for the mistypes. And then obviously there's certain areas that, you know, you could flag um, where it's close to things, but it you just get into the resilience factor of how do you have something that's resilient um, because yeah, that, that could flag a, a certain like copy paste, but it's not going to actually add value for when they get the command right or they move to the next command and run that. Uh, so I think that's one of those areas where we actually get too precise and we're not actually getting enough recall, uh, enough of that uh, malicious activity in our, in our scope uh, is what I would think. Uh, but, you know, if someone has come up with a better way where they can, you know, not peg down the processing of their SIM too much uh, to try to pattern match it, then I'd be, you know, all open ears uh, to hear how they're doing it. But pattern matching, uh, doing this regex and stuff, it gets pretty taxing on a SIM uh, or EDR. So we want to look at things like that. But one thing, too, I'd also like to touch on is, you know, we always get into these areas of, oh, we're red team, we're blue team, we're purple team. At the end of the day, we're all on the same team and we're pretty much scrimmaging against each other. You know, like, we're sparring partners to make the organization better uh, for when that re real adversary comes in there that we can kick them out. Uh, so I always like to think of it as, as iron sharpens iron, man sharpens man. Uh, there's a way that, you know, we're sparring partners and we need to challenge each other. So let's be open more uh, and have that collaboration of that purple team between the red and the blue to collaborate and really, you know, push the organization to that next level of security. Awesome answer. Yeah. And I love that analogy, right? Uh, because in an organization, especially when you have these internal teams, right? they are like the red and the blue and CTI, they're all sparring partners. You don't knock out your sparring partner in training. You're at the same corner uh, when it comes time to, um, to fight the real fight, right? Fight uh, Rocky or uh, Mike Tyson or, you know, I don't know if you're into mixed martial arts, I want to fight someone there, but you're on the same corner when it comes to time to actually uh, work together and fight off the, the real adversary. So really like that analogy. And again, thanks a lot, uh, Chris, for coming on. Um, as you can all see, right, I did a lot of intro and I'll be bringing in more people here because this is Purple Teaming. We uh, can do a little bit of it alone, but obviously no one's going to know everything. And you want to work with people that are smarter than you in uh, different areas. And Chris is definitely one of those. So you can follow him on Twitter at Secure Peacock. He drops a ton of knowledge. Uh, you're actually getting to 2,000 followers, Chris. I just noticed that. That's pretty cool. Um, I'm also available uh, at George Orchias with me. And uh, we're happy to continue a conversation there. Of course, reach out to us. Uh, we also have a SANS Discord. Um, it's all available there on our sans.org slash purple team. And hope to see you out at the next webcast, at the next workshop. 
And over to Carol for any final words from you. All right. Thank you so much, George and Chris, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.